Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a show where we will provide you fresh insights into South Asia's geopolitical, strategic and security situation. Let's begin the show with the headlines first. Indian Army neutralizes three terrorists in Jammu and Kashmir's Aknoor region. India condemns Pakistan at UNSC debate for Kashmir propaganda and minority repression. And Taliban tightens grip on Afghan women's voices outlawing prayer in public. In a bold and decisive move, the Indian Army scored a significant win in its fight against cross-border terrorism, neutralizing three terrorists in Jammu and Kashmir's Aknoor region. After an attack on an army ambulance, a swift counter-operation was launched with villagers providing critical intelligence. This encounter highlights Pakistan's disturbing role in supporting terror elements that continue to destabilize the region. Despite its claim of battling extremism, the Indian Army's relentless commitment sends a strong message with heightened security measures now in place to protect the Union territory. The Indian Army achieved a major victory in its ongoing fight against cross-border terrorism eliminating three terrorists in the Aknoor region of Jammu and Kashmir. The operation was launched after terrorists opened fire on an army ambulance on Monday morning in the Battle area, injuring personnel in what was a cowardly attack on medical staff. The ambulance was part of a convoy moving as part of larger operational efforts to secure the region. In response to this brazen attack, the army launched a swift and well-coordinated counter-operation. Acting on crucial intelligence provided by local villagers who spotted suspicious movements, special forces units, including National Security Guards commandos, were deployed to track down the terrorists hiding in the area. One terrorist was neutralized by October 28th evening and two more were gunned down the next day. ये जब डिटेक्ट हुए थे लोग उस इलाके में तो गांव की तरफ से हमको तुरंत खबर आ गई थी इसीलिए जो रिएक्शन था वो बहुत जल्दी हुआ इस दौरान उन्होंने कोशिश करी वो जिस परपस के लिए आए थे वो परपस नहीं हो पाया उनका लेकिन कोशिश करी कि वो हमारे कॉन्वॉय पे कुछ फायर करेंगे लेकिन हमारे ड्राइवर्स और क्यूआरटी के सूझबूझ से कोई नुकसान नहीं हुआ और तुरंत क्यूआरटी ने तैनात होकर इनको अपने उसी इलाके में पिन डाउन कर दिया और वहां से हिल नहीं पाई द सेकेंड फेज ऑफ द ऑपरेशन बिगैन एट सेवन एम ऑन ट्यूजडे इन द कॉल रीजन आफ्टर एन ओवर नाइट पॉज विद सोफिस्टिकेटेड इक्विपमेंट लाइक ड्रोन हेलीकॉप्टर्स एंड आर्मड व्हीकल्स सच एज द बी एम पी टू प्रेस्ड इन टू एक्शन द आर्मी लेफ्ट नो स्टोन अन टर्न टू एलिमिनेट द टेरिस्ट Officials confirmed that the third terrorist who was hiding in the forest near the Asan temple in Jogwan village was eliminated around 10 a.m. The involvement of Pakistan-based terror groups in the Aknoor attack is yet another instance of Islamabad's continued use of terrorism as a state policy. Despite Pakistan's hollow claims of combating terrorism, such cross-border infiltrations demonstrate how deeply terror outfits remain embedded in its system see pakistan is hell bent upon trying to revive the terrorism here in jammu and kashmir and it is not going to stop we have seen we have seen that pakistan is has nothing else to do except to raise up this issue through these terrorist attacks so that its own population over there is happy that yes something is being done about kashmir till the time we don't become proactive because right from 47 onwards to 2024 we have been reactive and we have been reactive even in the wars pakistan has started the wars even after uh, the terrorist attacks only twice we have become proactive and that is we have done the surgical strike and the balakot air strike but now it is high time that we become proactive The Aknoor encounter comes amid a spate of terrorist violence in the Union territory. Over the past two weeks, terrorists have killed 12 people, including civilians and migrant workers. On October 18, a migrant worker from Bihar was shot dead in Shopian. Two days later, seven people, including a doctor and six migrant workers, were murdered in Gandhabal. 
The brutality continued on October 24 when an army convoy was attacked in Baramula, killing two soldiers and two civilian porters. These recurring acts of terror reflect Pakistan's desperation to destabilize the region. In response to the escalating threat, the Indian government has ramped up security across both the Kashmir Valley and the Jammu region. Additional forces have been deployed to key areas to prevent infiltration along the line of control and the international border, where terrorists frequently attempt to cross over with the assistance of local guides. The Indian Army's relentless operations ensure that these evil designs are thwarted, ensuring peace and security for the people of Jammu and Kashmir. In recent months, Jammu and Kashmir has seen a surge in attacks, with police encountering new strategies from terrorists. Who is fueling this renewed terror and how can armed forces respond? To answer all these questions, we have former top cop Shesh Polvat, who has witnessed the rise of militancy firsthand and the evolving landscape of Jammu and Kashmir. Shesh Polvat is an IPS officer who has served as one of Jammu Kashmir's most respected top cops. Known for his dedication and resilience, Vaid led the Jammu Kashmir police as Director General during a critical period marked by heightened militancy and security challenges. Hello sir, welcome to the show. Thank you. What do you have to say about the escalation of terror attacks in the region lately? There seems to be a concerted effort from across uh, the border by deep state of Pakistan to up the ante, uh, to increase the number of terror, terror attacks. Initially, they started with Jammu region, if you re remember, uh, first from Rajauri Poonch and then spreading to other districts of Jammu region, taking advantage of the uh, gaps in the security here in Jammu region because of relative peace in last uh, for last 15 years. Uh, now, the uh, security grid has geared up here also in Jammu region. Now, I see uh, uh, ever since the new political government uh, after the elections has uh, taken over here in Jammu and Kashmir, Kashmir Valley is seeing upsurge in uh, terror attacks. Uh, attacks are also taking place in Kashmir. I think uh, the Pakistan's uh, deep state uh, probably want uh, Kashmir to be in news. That's why they are resorting to this. How have Pakistan-based terror groups evolved their tactics in recent months? Yes, uh, in fact, that is the strategy of uh, the Pakistan's uh, ISI. Uh, the terror groups are being uh, provided with latest weaponry, uh, what uh, Americans had left behind in Afghanistan, M4 rifles, uh, which have uh, uh, the I, uh, the sniper uh, IPs, the uh, night vision facility. So, uh, the in improved weaponry is being provided to these terrorists. Communication also, they are uh, upgrading the communication system uh, using some Chinese app, uh, which is very difficult to, uh, which is internet based, very difficult to detect. And uh, the uh, hit and run tactics which have been observed uh, particularly in Jammu region. The, they are highly trained in, uh, um, uh, in mountain warfare, jungle warfare. Do you see a shift in infiltration patterns along the line of control? If so, what factors are driving this change? See, earlier uh, infiltration used to take place uh, both from the LOC and the IB uh, through uh, finding gaps on the border, but uh, of late uh, certain uh, tunnels have been detected in uh, particularly the IB sector and the LOC area, I think uh, uh, more and more drones are being used as per uh, reports. Uh, uh, using drone uh, technology, you can drop uh, uh, the uh, weapons quite deep inside. And uh, I am told there are some drones, even um, it can carry heavy payload also. 
Do you think the recent attacks are an attempt by Pakistan to internationalize the Kashmir issue once again? See, Pakistan has failed in, on all fronts. When Article 370 was abrogated, it went across all over the world, all capitals of the world, uh, crying about what India has done. No one listened to them. They have been talking about Kashmir uh, in various international fora. No one is prepared to listen to Pakistan. It has lost credibility on the international uh, arena. And uh, India's diplomatic offensive, both uh, in the UN and in uh, uh, other international uh, fora, uh, the Pakistan uh, people have seen through the Pakistan's game plan. And I don't think it carries any credibility today. How do you assess the role of Pakistan's deep state in sustaining these terror networks? They are the brain behind. It is all doings of the deep state of Pakistan. Uh, uh, no one buys their argument that uh, these are uh, uh, non-state actors and all bullshit. No one believes them. Uh, it's all uh, uh, the handiwork of deep state because they have to uh, sell their credibility to people of Pakistan. Otherwise, the very same Pakistan people uh, who had so much of uh, respect for Pakistan army, today uh, they uh, don't trust them and they uh, will start questioning why should so much of budget uh, be spent on uh, Pakistan defense and army. What implications might these attacks and India's response have on regional stability, including India-Pakistan relations? See, these attacks will definitely affect uh, India-Pakistan relations because uh, ultimately India's stand is very clear. We will talk to you only if you stop terrorism. You cannot carry on with uh, both talk and terror. So, I think present government headed by Mr. Narendra Modi, is very clear and clear message has gone to Pakistan. They have to learn this. I don't think there is any change of heart in Pakistan's uh, establishment. Maybe people of Pakistan want change, but I don't think uh, their establishment will uh, let this go. They, they, they must understand in very uncertain terms that terror and talks will not go, go along together. So, they must stop this terror machinery, the only thing they export, not only to India, to the rest of the world. Thank you so much, sir, for your insights. Dhanabad. India's permanent representative to the UN took a bold stance against Pakistan's attempts to deflect attention from critical issues, labelling Pakistan's focus on Kashmir as mischievous provocation. By bringing Pakistan's egregious human rights violations against its minorities to light, the Indian diplomat underscored the harrowing experience of Hindu, Christian and Sikh women who endure forced conversions and abductions. India's powerful statement aims to keep the UN debate centred on genuine issues of peace building and to expose the disturbing reality of Pakistan's treatment of its minority communities. India's permanent representative to the UN, Parvatha Nini Harish, lashed out at Pakistan for trying to bring the Kashmir issue into the debate, calling it a mischievous provocation that aligns with Pakistan's long-standing tactic of spreading misinformation. Harish emphasized that raising Kashmir in this setting was inappropriate and detracted from the important focus on peace building. It is despicable yet entirely predictable that one delegation has chosen to indulge in mischievous provocation based on their tried and tested tactic of spreading misinformation and disinformation. It's completely misplaced to indulge in such political propaganda at this important annual debate. India's response extended beyond diplomacy, shedding light on the ongoing atrocities against Pakistan's religious minorities. Women from Hindu, Christian and Sikh communities remain especially vulnerable to forced convergence and abduction. Human rights organizations report over 1,000 cases of forced convergence each year, often involving girls as young as 12 to 15. 
These girls are abducted, married to their captors, and coerced into converting to Islam. We are well aware that the condition of women belonging to minority communities, notably Hindus, Sikhs, and Christians in that country, remains deplorable. An estimated 1,000 women of these minority communities, as per data of the Human Rights Commission of that particular country, are subject to abduction, forced religious conversions, and forced marriages every year. The situation is particularly dire in Sindh, home to a significant Hindu population. Activists estimate that over 20 Hindu girls are abducted each month, many of whom never return to their families. Families seeking justice encounter indifference or hostility from law enforcement, leaving victims without recourse. Minority women in Pakistan face not just gender-based violence, but also religious persecution, making them doubly marginalized. Despite comprising 48.5% of the population, women belonging to minority faiths bear the brunt of social and economic exclusion. With minorities constituting only 2% of Pakistan's population, they disproportionately account for forced marriages and conversions. Christian women are also vulnerable. Many have been falsely accused of blasphemy, facing harsh social stigma and even death sentences. So we need to remember Pakistani authorities are part of the society they live in. Usually these accusations of blasphemy are done to deflect from corruption or they're done to seize land or they're done to seize property. And the police has always been complicit in it. You look at the judiciary has been complicit in it. You look at case after case where women are taken from their houses, converted. And then the courts will say, oh, well, if you convert out of Islam now, it's the death penalty because, uh, you know, apostasy uh, carries the death penalty out there. Uh, the girl has no option but to say, well, you know, I've done it of my own free will and I'm staying here and that's it. So you look at the entire system. Uh, you look at all the cases that have been thrown out where, uh, you know, this Christian woman uh, was given asylum in France and things like that. Uh, it's been a systematic case of the authorities colluding in it at every single level. International watchdogs, including Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, have condemned Pakistan for its failure to protect minority women. In a joint report, these organizations highlighted how the judiciary and law enforcement are complicit in maintaining a system of violence and impunity. India's scathing statement not only challenged Pakistan's diplomatic approach, but also exposed the ongoing repression of minorities within its borders. By highlighting these issues on an international stage, India aims to refocus the debate on the real concerns of human rights violations and peace building. The Taliban's harsh rule in Afghanistan has taken another repressive turn, now forbidding women from even praying aloud in each other's presence. Labeling a woman's voice as aura, the regime's minister for the propagation of virtue and prevention of vice has placed new limits on basic expressions of faith, including Quranic recitations. This degree is just the latest in a string of restrictions that severely erode women's rights in Afghanistan drawing renewed global condemnation and calls for action to restore fundamental rights. A report. In Afghanistan, the Taliban regime has escalated its crackdown on women's freedoms, now banning them from playing aloud in each other's presence. Muhammad Khalid Hanafi, Taliban Minister for the Propagation of Virtue and Prevention of Vice, justified this oppressive restriction by calling a woman's voice avra, something to be concealed from public life, even among women. This latest degree, reported by Afghan media, prohibits women from any form of audible expression, including reciting the Quran or enjoying music. Hanafi added that if women are forbidden from calling takbir or azan, the Islamic call to prayer, they should certainly avoid 
any form of singing or music. Afghanistan has become the only country in the world where girls are barred from schooling beyond the sixth grade marking an unprecedented reversal in women's rights and social freedoms. The Taliban's draconian measures go far beyond education. Women are denied most forms of employment, lack of protection from gender-based violence and face severe barriers to healthcare access. Even simple measures like sports or visiting parks are now beyond reach. I think it would be accurate to say that ever since the Taliban took over power, these years have seen a steady but inexorable marginalization of women in all fields, whether it is education, whether it is employment. If you remember, initially restrictions were put on education in view of the law and order situation. But once women were kept out, they were not allowed to come in at all. And what has happened is, slowly but surely, they have been kept out of all institutions of education. As for employment, it is clear that, you know, uh, they have this particular system, no women may be allowed to be, you know, uh, can, can be allowed outside unless they have, she has a chaperone. Now, initially, they allowed women to work with NGOs, etc. Now, even that right has been taken away. So, when it comes to employment, also, what women have seen is their continuous and steady exclusion from any avenue of employment whatsoever, whether it is private or public. Since reclaiming control in 2021, the Taliban's wave of restrictions has tightened. In August, they mandated full body coverings and face veils for women in public. Female healthcare workers, among the few allowed to work outside the home, face prohibitions on speaking in public or addressing male relatives, even regarding medical issues. Rights groups warn that this escalation will only further suffocate Afghan women. Earlier in September, Afghan women leaders took their plea for intervention to the United Nations. At a summit led by UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, these leaders highlighted the harrowing state of women's rights in Afghanistan, calling for urgent global action. Without educated women, without women in employment, including in leadership roles, and without recognizing the rights and freedoms of one half of its population, Afghanistan will never take its rightful place on the global stage. The Taliban's treatment of women is a systematic stripping of rights reminiscent of their brutal rule in the late 1990s, with recent decrees including the reintroduction of stoning for adultery. Most countries refuse to recognize the Taliban government, and the United Nations has made it clear that recognition is impossible as long as bans on female education and employment persist. Global condemnation remains steadfast, but the Taliban dismisses it as foreign interference, continuing their iron grip on Afghan women's lives. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.